further dissect Nikolai Ivanovich Vavilov, the man who possibly more than anyone else in history has helped us to understand where our food comes from and also cemented the idea of genetic diversity as a necessary science, we will now have Dr. Colin Curie, the first speaker of the day. Dr. Colin Curie is a crop diversity specialist at the International Center of Tropical Agriculture, CIAT, in Colombia, and a researcher at the USDA National Lab Laboratory of Genetic Resources Preservation in Fort Collins, Colorado. Collins' interest is enhancing food security, human health, and sustainability of agricultural production systems through the conservation of use of crop genetic resources. Most of the time he is researching how he can better conserve the wild relatives of food crops and trying to understand how changes in diversity in our diets and agricultural production impact food security. The title of his presentation today is Nikolai Ivanovich Vavilov and the Geography Conservation of Use of Crop Diversity. Everyone, please join me in welcoming Dr. Curry. Good morning. I have a question for the coordinators. This is not, uh, sorry. This is necessary for recording, so I need both of these. Yeah. Great. Okay. Hey. It's more than, more than an honor to be here this morning um, to get to talk, converse with you all about a subject that's dear to my heart. Um, who am I to speak about this person that I've not met? Uh, I can say that I've been a, a student of Avalov's, I think, through my, through my career for the last 15 or 20 years and have been trying to read up and understand this phenomenal human being. Um, what I hope to do in the, in the time that I'm up here to start out this day is to attempt an answer to an interesting question that I think the student organizers uh, put together for us, which is um, what was Vavilov's method, if he had a method exactly? Um, and so at the end of this presentation, I would actually like to try to attempt an, an answer to that question. The Vavilov method, what exactly is that? Um, Equally important, I'd, I'd like to attempt uh, to draw w what is pertinent in, in fits and parts and stories of his life to, to what's going on right now with us. What are the most pertinent, salient um, issues and ideas that really are, are striking home, hopefully on a, more of an emotional or, or, or um, a, a deeper level than just a mental one. So we'll see how I do with that. Um, <clears throat> In three words, I think Nikolai Vavilov, for me, uh, would be adventurer, scientist, humanitarian. Um, <clears throat> I'm going to leave this slide up for a while, and uh, I think I'm hoping that you'll just get the impact of looking at this photo. It's an interesting photo. It's probably his most famous photo that's around. Uh, by many measures, by almost all measures, an extraordinary human being. Apparently an incredible capacity for learning, for absorbing information. He spoke at least, conversant in at least 15 languages. Um, equally so, a passion for passing on that knowledge, for engaging others, for getting his students, his workers excited. Within his 30s, um, he managed already in his 30s over 10,000 staff. Uh, apparently was highly um, influential in their directions and therefore has passed on even today with um, many, many workers considering themselves still students of Vavilov. Apparently he also rarely slept uh, except on airplanes where he wasn't able to do much else because it was too rocky to, to work or anything like that. And uh, as was mentioned, I think earlier, um, although I think I've looked into this quote quite a bit, and uh, the closest definition that I know to this quote is, um, this is his most famous quote really, time is short, time is short, there is so much to do. Um, and I like this photo in a sense because I, I think this is a guy who would much rather be doing anything else than sitting and, look, and having this photo taken of him. I mean, you can kind of see it in his face, he's kind of like, all right, can we get on with the rest of our lives here? <clears throat> so what was Vavilov? Um, what was his call to adventure? What was this hero's journey that he was on? 
I think personally this call to adventure was motivated by two things fundamentally. One was that he was fascinated by science, by discovery. Like many of us, I think, in this room, he just really wanted to understand and discover um, so much of what was going on. And it was a unique and interesting period for him that I'll talk about in a minute. The second thing, I think, was that he was, um, he was motivated by humanitarian reasons, particularly having experienced or known about um, two major crop failures in his country and starvation that occurred because of them. And so his science or his application of science into the world was very much motivated by trying to end hunger, maybe what we call now food security. <clears throat> he didn't exist uh, in a box. He didn't come out of nowhere. He had a lot of help, um, phenomenal scientists that helped him. Also, the background of science coming together uh, meant that Linnaean botany was rediscovered around the time he was getting started. That is um, taxonomical, taxonom I'm sorry. Uh, sorry, let me back up on that. Um, the Linnaean stuff had come forward. Um, Mendelian genetics had been discovered right around the time that he was getting started, rediscovered. The Darwinian theories of evolution coming together, continental drift. Many of the, the major theories and ideas were coming together, and he was starting to understand that. Likewise, he had opportunities in assistance. He was able to travel to the UK um, to study at, at John Innes Center with Bateson and others. He had a lot of back and forth with scientists throughout his whole career. Um, and there were American scientists and explorers um, as he was coming up, also exploring in, in, in his region that influenced him. <clears throat> so his travels. Uh, one of his most famous, uh, let's say, feats was simply being able to pull off this. I apologize for a little bit of difficulty in um, seeing this slide. It comes from a book of his, but it's quite difficult to recreate because there are so many lines. Hopefully you can see those white lines. So these are his travels over 25 years from 1916 to about 1940. Uh, if you're able to see that, you'll see that it was extensive. Some of these were enabled, of course, through trains, uh, uh, planes, and automobiles. Many of them were not. They were on mules. They were hiking. They were walking. Uh, they were traversing incredible territory. He was an opportunist in the sense, in the positive sense, that uh, this was not like he would just had all the funding, uh, as was mentioned before, and, and just was able to do this. In fact, one of his first missions was um, he was brought down to try to understand um, health issues that were going on with, with Russian soldiers, with Soviet soldiers in northern Iran, and took the opportunity, once he'd resolved that issue of what was going on with these soldiers and their health, with the, the wheat that they were eating, to start exploring. And he sort of just kind of moved up into the mountains. And that started a very resourceful individual's ability to, um, to take the opportunity, you know, to be outside and, and start collecting head off into the hills as much as he could. <clears throat> um, this is a picture of the Pamirs, which is one of the first places that, uh, one of his first major trips one of still the most inaccessible regions of the world for, for reasons that are quite clear just by looking at the photo. And if you don't mind uh, a minute, I would read a, a passage from this book called Five Continents, which is available as a PDF online. Uh, you could search for it. Um, <clears throat> so this is, from, this is a journal from after he came back, but it's really his journaling from the, from, from the trip. And he says, we were faced, this is of course a translation, yeah. Uh, we were faced with passages over the so-called Avrings. I'm not sure I'm pronouncing that correctly. Um, does anybody know what that term means by chance? Well, this is an Avring, these uh, barely pathways. We were faced with passages over the so-called Avrings, which are familiar to all travelers in the Pamirs. To this day, I still remember one of the most difficult passages. The trail wound its way like a thin snake along the Piance River, along a steep mountain above an abyss some 1,000 meters deep. Every now and then the trail was replaced by offering shelves. Sometimes the trail narrowed, sometimes it got wider, but often it was like a staircase with high steps over which the horses, even though accustomed to mountains, could move only with great caution. It seemed that we had finally passed this very difficult trail so that we could mount the horses and continue on. But suddenly, from the cliff above the trail, two gigantic eagles flew out from a nest circling on enormous wings. 
My horse shied and bolted, galloping along the trail and the Avring. The rein was unexpectedly torn out of my hand and I had to hang on to the mane. Above my head were cliffs, but below me, 1,000 meters down in the deep ravine, rumbled the beautiful blue Piance, the upper reaches of one of the great rivers of inner Asia. That is the experience which afterwards this traveler remembers best. Such moments steal one for the rest of one's life. They prepare scientists for all difficulties, all adversities and everything unexpected. In this respect, my first great expedition was especially useful. Powerful passage, especially if he was mostly writing it for himself. Um, I also wonder in that passage, because he wrote it before the rest of his life happened, and, and we know that his life um, in many ways only got more difficult. I, I wonder, you know, at the end of his life, if he had if he would have written exactly that, um, that it would have prepared him for what came next. I don't, I don't know that answer. <clears throat> what was the treasure that this hero uh, was looking for? The treasure was crop diversity, as we know. Um, I won't cover this very much because I think it will be covered by, by speakers through the rest of the day, uh, looking for diversity and what that means, and it's important in crops. What I will say is that he's considered one of the world's greatest plant explorers ever. It's hard to metric that. What does that mean? There are people in this room that have collected, gone on very dangerous missions, looked in many places and collected many seeds. What is clear is that he probably collected, among all individuals in the world, probably the most single amount of seeds, um, maybe up to 200,000 accessions in his, in, his, in his 25 years of doing it, which is quite a feat. <clears throat> His discoveries were also about uh, the geography of diversity. What I, the slide that I'm showing is actually uh, an evolution past his time, past his death. He started to understand that there were places in the world that had richer or more concentrated amounts of diversity in crops, um, what he called centers of origin. He also called them hearths of origin. He called them centers of formation. Um, as Francisco mentioned, the, the, the evolution has moved on and we've, we've still textured this. He started with about three centers, eventually up to maybe seven or eight. Um, this one shows eight. And he traveled to every single one of these um, in his lifetime. Why were these places so uh, interesting in terms of diversity? There's a, there's a lot of reasons and you could lecture certainly for an hour about that. But in one short sentence, I think it has to do with time. It has to do with people of diverse origins and types in actually diverse environments having worked with plant materials for a very long period of time, for thousands of years. And because of that, this incredible diversity of forms being created. <clears throat> so he started to understand, I, I would say, the geography of diversity through time. <clears throat> The other thing that he understood apparently on these trips was that times were changing, that that diversity was starting to disappear, largely because the world was becoming more connected. Um, these isolated regions like the Pamirs were being more connected up and those unique forms of diversity were starting to disappear. And so what he did as he, um, as he brought these seeds and moved them back to the Soviet Union for the betterment of that nation but also beyond that, I think he was a, he was a, he was a global person in the sense of, of, of a humanitarian beyond his board, borders. Um, he was gathering those seeds for the betterment of the, that nation, but he was also doing it, I think, um, somewhat for conservation. I don't think it was called that at the time, but he understood that there needed to be places in the world that could help hold seeds and keep them um, like an ark, so to speak. Uh, this was the beginning of his voyage. There then is about 20 years that I'll just fast forward in which he was incredibly successful in becoming a powerful scientist in the Soviet Union, in, in um, forming an institute with so many 10,000 staff at least, uh, international recognition. Um, I, I, I want to emphasize one thing though. It was still under a lot of challenge. After the October Revolution, he was planting out these seeds that he brought back. There were folks, there were soldiers, there were um, common people that certainly did not understand what he was doing, that were eating the crops. He numerous times had to move his field sites. Um, numerous times they were all destroyed. Numerous times did not have money. 
Um, all of these things that we talk about now, they were happening certainly, certainly, um, even more, let's say, to Nikolai Vavilov. And yet, uh, somehow, he was very creative uh, in, in figuring out how to, how to persist. Um, <clears throat> I'm going to fast forward now to probably part of the story that most people know the best, which is interesting because Vavilov wasn't in it, really. In the Siege of Leningrad, uh, St. Petersburg, which was 872 days. So this was a, a Nazi advance into Russia, into the Soviet Union, in which the city was cut off, surrounded. Let me just repeat that, 872 days. Um, <clears throat> 1.5 million people died. No water, no heat, three winters. Uh, and that first winter was when a number of his colleagues uh, starved to death. And that story is pretty well known, so I won't cover it, I think, other than to say that um, it's a remarkable and hair-raising fact still to me to think that there are scientists, there were scientists in the world that um, felt so compelled by their work that they died surrounded by food. Uh, the rice curator here um, apparently died at that desk with rice bags around it. And Kerry Fowler, who I had the pleasure to, um, to work with for a period of time at the Crop Trust, who visited here a number of times, asked the modern scientists there, like how, you know, just trying to get a little deeper, like how, how did that happen? I mean, how did people really have that, that strength character? Excuse me. And, and the simple answer was, well, we were students of Vavilov. Right? I mean, it was clear that this was a crazy time in the world. And that there needed to be, once the craziness cleared off, there needed to be uh, solutions and answers. And these seeds were, were the solutions and the answers. And so um, it wasn't a choice. It was a, it was a mandate. <clears throat> we get to the second picture of Vavilov, which he looks you know, even less excited to be having a picture of him, obviously. Um, so the hero's journey it gets cut off here. Um, Vavilov, as was mentioned, was a victim of politics, uh, not just of war, of decisions by political bodies to, um, to favor pseudoscience, uh, alternative visions of how agriculture should progress um, that really went against the world's um, moving innovation of, of essentially of Mendelian genetics or Western genetics. Um, <clears throat> I think that that's probably well known for folks too, so I won't mention it beyond that point. Um, I think that it's interesting to think that we often remember people um, whose lives were cut short. Somehow there's, uh, there's, there's something to that. Um, and his alternative ending to this hero story is certainly like that. It was, it was, it was a life that had so much tremendous potential and then it was, it was cut short at that point. Um, but that's not to say that his work ended there his tradition within his own institute and all these people, um, but certainly around the world, including in the United States. Jack Harlan is a good example of a scientist that wanted actually very much to go there and work with him, Junior, and uh, wasn't able to because of those politics, but had those ideas and brought them forward, understanding the, the sinners and what he called sinners and non-sinners of diversity. Um, and I would count myself humbly um, along the list of people that are still trying to understand uh, what we're calling primary regions of diversity in the world. And in a few minutes, I'll talk a little bit about my research in, in understanding these, these regions of diversity. Um, the other legacy that I think Vavilov has a lot uh, to do with, and, and, and we in the gene banking community consider ourselves to be students of, is, is the legacy of, of seed banks or gene banks around the world. This is hopeless to understand, so I'll clean it up a little bit. And these are the world's big public gene banks. Uh, you can see the Vavilov Center, now named after him, post-1968, uh, I believe, uh, up in, yeah, I can't even stand over there, so you can see it up there. Um, <clears throat> you can see the United States system here, and I think that the, uh, the Texas A&M station is hidden a little bit behind the bar of Simmet there, unfortunately, but it is on the map. Um, you can see in the yellow, those bars are our international centers, public international centers and the blue bars are national centers. 
If you'll allow me, I'll take just a turn for a few minutes and talk about what was going on in the United States, which I think is quite interesting. In the United States, well before Vavilov, of course, there is a big tradition of collecting seeds from around the world and bringing them in. Um, that starts with our founding fathers. The sinner guy there is the guy who came up with this, this quote. And, and you may have seen this quote before. This is uh, the, the fuller version of this quote, which I find interesting. Uh, it wasn't just bread grains. It was also oils. Uh, and other things that he was interested in. Uh, this sinner guy is also the guy who is famous for risking his life trying to bring a rice variety from, uh, from Italy into the United States. So these guys were all talking about the value of bringing seeds and, and the usefulness of, of genetic resources, even though they weren't called that at the time. <clears throat> Frank Meyer uh, was collecting before Vavilov, um, and he was and up into the time of Avalov, and he was collecting very much also in the Soviet Union and in East Asia. He died on a collecting trip. He might be one of our most famous um, extinct plant, uh, plant explorers. Dr. Simpson, of course, one of our most famous extant plant explorers. Um, <clears throat> what is an interesting thing, I think, to think about at this time, this is, again, still pre, pre the major period of Avalov, is if you look at this table on the left, uh, this is distributions in the United States of seed packets to American farmers. In fact, the single greatest year for distributing, anybody know the greatest year for the, the US government in distributing seeds? Single guess? It's actually that last year there, 1897. 20 million seeds distributed in the United States to farmers. An incredible thing. I, it's still phenomenal to try to understand the, the the ability to do this by US mail, to push it out to research stations and get it out to farmers. An incredible effort, truly incredible. Um, I like this picture. I found it because it's difficult to find homesteader pictures that have the vegetables actually in the pictures. There's lots where you can see their farm tools and all of that, but um, some good looking vegetables, some really big stuff there. I think that's pretty cool. And that has a lot to do with these efforts of moving germplasm out into the frontier as it, as it was moving. In fact, I would, as I was thinking about it, I might posit that it was one of the greatest agricultural experiments of all time. Um, thinking about millions and millions of seed packets being put out there and farmers just trialing them and seeing what works as the West moved West. <clears throat> and that brings us up to the, to the stations now, to, the, to our modern national plant germplasm system, which I have the honor of, of working for there in Fort Collins. And you can see College Station here. Uh, I think that we can feel proud of a couple of things, especially. One is having one of the world's largest collections, still probably arguably the largest collection in the world of seeds. Um, but that final statistic there is the most important by far. 250,000 is nothing like 20 million a year, but it is still an order of magnitude more seeds than any other national seed bank uh, distributes. And why that is I think, um, well, it's a, it's a research question, actually, I'd like to answer in the next couple of years. But I think that it has to do with, um, with having an open public system, with having relatively um, trustworthy, known system and scientists, with knowing that you can order and you can get what you're looking for largely, that hopefully it's alive, um, that, you, that it is what you hoped for. Um, for all of its challenges and deficiencies, uh, quite a phenomenal system that's existed for so long and, and hopefully will can will exist into the future. And then there's this, and I was glad that it went up also in the introductory slides. Um, I can speak about this a little bit because I was at the Crop Trust when we opened it in 2008. And I, I, I bring it up simply to link it, I think, all the way back to Vavilov and efforts in, in seed banking. This is, the, um, this is the natural evolution, I would say, our global evolution of seed banks. This is our global safety backup. Um, for those that aren't immediately familiar with this. This is Svalbard Global Seed Vault in Norwegian territory in the Arctic Circle. Uh, it was built there for a lot of purposes, for political, um, let's say, balance or, or neutrality. Uh, it was built there because it's easy to store seeds. It's dry and cold naturally. Um, and it was built there maybe because it was so beautiful. It was built there uh, because it has natural protection um, <laughs> if it's needed. <clears throat> And it's a very simple concept. It's really just a tunnel in the ground with three big holes. It has a little extra cooling if needed, but even if that cooling goes off, 
it will stay relatively cold for many hundreds of years. <clears throat> if you head down that tunnel, you eventually get to the one of the three. There's only one that's full right now, or not even full right now. Um, but it is now holding, um, I will call it still, the second largest collection in one place of seeds. I think still in Fort Collins, um, we have a little bit more, but it will replace it at one point. These seeds are not Norwegian. They are not Svalbard's. These are safety duplicates of National Seed Banks and anyone else who's, who's a kind of a bona fide research or seed facility who'd like to deposit a copy just in case. And that just in case is an interesting one because this place was termed by, by the media really as, as the doomsday vault. But doomsday um, is not really the end of the world. Doomsday is every day in seed banks. Doomsday is when the electricity goes out. Doomsday is when you don't have the financial resources to keep people on, et cetera. This is a picture, unfortunately, of a fire that happened in, in, the, um, in the Philippine gene bank a couple of years ago. And, um, and we all know, or, or, or perhaps you may have seen the news, that ICARDA, uh, of course, um, due to the, the strife there with the war, was able to uh, recuperate some of their seeds from, from Svalbard and, and restart, essentially, a, a seed bank in the last couple of years. Um, I wanted to touch on one other aspect that I, I think is kind of a natural evolution that, that does go back to Vavilov, and it, it touches on my research. There's been a, a huge progress or evolution of politics in seeds uh, around the world, and those have been, um, how, do you, how do you put this? Those have been interesting, they've been challenging, they've been necessary, I would say. Um, there's still very much to do there. What I would like to do is draw the line from where we're at with those things all the way back to Vavilov. And one of the things that we're very much at is this international treaty that's on the left on plant genetic resources, which in its essence is about two things. It's about conservation of, of our genetic resources, of our seeds, and it's about improving the ability to share seeds, especially across national boundaries for farmers, but um, it, through plant breeders to be able to get seeds more easily. Um, what is the argument for having systems that make it easier for plant breeders to get seeds? Well, they have to do with interdependence, that we need seeds that come from different parts of the world. And how do you make that argument, especially when actually the actual data on who gets seeds from who is very difficult to obtain? It's quite privatized and, and, um, and difficult to share. And so we did a little bit of research on that, and that goes back to this map. Um, the first thing that we did was for the crops and commodities that are measured by the UN FAO statistical office for what people eat around the world or what people produce around the world, which is not all crops, but it's the major crops. We mapped out what their origins were or what we call their primary regions of diversity. It is an updated understanding, I would say, a, a different twist on what Vavilov was looking at. It's not just where they came from, but it's where their most important diversity areas are that have been used by plant breeding. Um, that's why, uh, <clears throat> for instance, we did list grape germplasm here in the United States. It's not that grapes were domesticated here in the United States, but that germplasm has been so incredibly important for the global grape industry that we've considered it a, a primary region in that sense. So it's a little bit different. Um, what we then did was we looked for each country around the world at what they eat and what they grow, and we linked that back to uh, where does that food come from? Where are those primary regions of diversity? So for the United States, if you want to map out in terms of what, I, what we eat as a, as a nation on average for calories, this is the map of the regions of diversity of those foods. If we are what we eat, this is what, where we come from. <clears throat> if you look at fat instead of calories, it looks a little bit different. This is, of course, because one major uh, sorry, this is for plants. Uh, we're not looking at animals here. Um, this is one major oil uh, that we eat quite a lot of in the United States, of course, grow quite a lot of. You might be able to guess what that is. Soybean. Please be interactive if you want. You can throw out things. Thanks. <laughs> and likewise, in terms of production quantity, in terms of tons, this is what the United States produces in terms of where it comes from originally. It's primary regions of diversity. Of course, you can see maize there quite easily and the wheats and the alfalfas, et cetera. <clears throat> in harvested area, it, you know, the whites aren't completely white. There are contributions from all over the world, just so you know, but there are certain parts of the world that are just so much really sinners for us and what we grow in the United States. So you can see that there. 
Okay, so that's what the United States looks like. So the argument is pretty clear there. Of course, our food systems have benefited from, do come from many other parts of the world, right? Um, that's pretty clear. But what do you, uh, what, how do you make that argument for the whole world? What does the whole world look like? To do the whole world, we needed a circle. Um, this is a, a graph that comes from the genomics community. You might know these, these circos graphs. What we've done here is we've grouped nations into regions. There's 23 regions around the world. So all the countries in those regions are there. The A and Z is Australia and New Zealand. You can see North America, which is the United States and Canada, Central America and Mexico, et cetera. IOI is Indian Ocean Islands. Those 23 are the same regions that we defined here as these primary regions of diversity, right? And so what we did was we then linked as uh, we created, like in this case for calories, a regional average diet. So for North America, it's the United States and Canada kind of together weighted by population, so it looks a little more like the United States and Canada. Um, and then we started to map out what are the connections from that diet to um, the regions where that food comes from. These are just the first lines that I'd like to show you, the most important ones. And that orange one you see from Central America with the bar, um, that heavy bar there in Central America that connects to Southern Africa, that is means that that is those are crops that have their primary regions of diversity, their origins in Central America that are really important in Southern Africa. Does that make sense? Any guess? There's one particular crop. It's really the most important crop for calories in Southern Africa. Wow. Not cassava. Corn. The most important by far. Um, and you can already see on this graph, uh, you can see the, the, the Mediterranean or the Near East, the Fertile Crescent crops, that Southeast Mediterranean, West Asia area. That's the wheats and the barleys, et cetera that are um, already important in Europe. You can see them important in Australia and New Zealand and South America, et cetera. And you can see rice already. So basically you can see corn, bean, uh, corn rice, and wheat already like in its connections around the world. But that's just the beginning of our, our connections to the rest of the world in terms of what we eat. If you start to just load on uh, the entire diet and where it comes from, well, you end up with a kaleidoscope, um, a kaleidoscope that I would call as an estimation of how interconnected we are in terms of where our food comes from and its origins and where we eat it now. And it's not just uh, our, our diets, but it's also what we produce. This is measuring it in terms of monetary value, production value. You can see, of course, in East Asia, particularly China, the, the massive amount of, of global production that's done there and the value of that and its connections to, to many other regions of the world. If that's too complicated for you, which I totally understand, I've, I've, I was hopeful that that graph would work for most of you. Being scientists, I've totally failed with the public on that graph numerous times. So, um, This is a simplified version that simply says, well, how much of a national diet is food that originally comes from elsewhere, that's primary regions of diversity are not in the same region? And if you map it out that way, you can see it like this. The United States um, metrics are on the bottom there in the comparison with the global average, but let's say at least 90% or so of the, the U.S. diet is food that, that its origins are elsewhere in the world. It's in fact higher. That's a metric that has to do with uncertainty, why it's actually um, 90%. It's really 99 point something percent. Hmm. And same with production. If you look at that, the, the numbers, the statistics on production are a little easier to look at, so the, the, there's less variation. Easily for the United States in terms of production quantity, 99% of our, our food is is, is coming from elsewhere in the world. You can also see the band of uh, in the in the in the tropics and in the centers of diversity that it's a little less dependent on other parts of the world. But the most important point here, really, that we're trying to make is that there's no place in the world, no country in the world that eats only its own food, nowhere, nowhere. <clears throat> and that's only gone up over time. We looked out over the last 50 years. All you need to know here is that over time, people are eating even more and more food that comes from elsewhere, whose primary regions of diversity are foreign. <clears throat> so moving towards the end here, um, I mentioned that Vavilov, this adventure scientist, humanitarian, his life was cut short in this hero's journey. Um, I don't think that that journey has ended, certainly, and there's still quite a lot to do. 
the challenges to agricultural production are, are, are very much with us. They're new and interesting and different. The challenges are very much about sustainability, how we're going to produce enough food, of course, into the future, but do it um, within the, the wise use of our natural resources. Um, <clears throat> And also increasingly towards the health challenges that haven't been resolved and also the new health challenges, particularly ob obesity epidemics and all of that. Um, the collecting has not finished either. And I've been involved in a project for, uh, for the last six years that's been looking just at the crop wild relatives, the, the, the wild species related to crops. And the, the honest truth is besides from, again, folks like Dr. Simpson who have done quite a lot of work to collect for their crop, there's still a lot to do. Um, to go out and collect that material. Hopefully, the politics will be um, will continue to evolve so that there will be international collaboration to work together on this. Um, that is, of course, an increasing challenge because plants in general are more threatened uh, by habitat modification, invasive species, climate change, et cetera, et cetera. So it's really a call right now. We still need to go out and collect. If you are um, if you feel engaged to be a plant explorer, I think there is still an opportunity there. Um, you have to be, as always, as uh, creative and inventive in terms of the money issue um, to get out there to be able to do it. Uh, I also wanted to mention that that research on the origins of crops is hardly done. In fact, just this year, earlier this year, or uh, I'm mean, sorry, not of 2017 or 2016, uh, it, it turns out that watermelons aren't from where we thought they were. Um, anybody know where watermelons were considered to have been from, by chance? Africa, true. Southern Africa was the, was the idea, and it's been in the literature for 20 years. It turns out it's wrong. It's West Africa. Um, nobody really knows about eggplants, for instance. People are still arguing, let's say, very strongly whether it's truly basically African or South Asian. So if you are a person that's called to try to understand where crops come from, um, there is still very much to do there, too. I, I think it's, it's honestly a fascinating thing. Like, how do we not know that still? I mean, these are our most important connections to the biotic world, and, and there's still like a lot of research that could be done there. I find that a fascinating, a fascinating question. <clears throat> How is Vavilov's legacy faring? Um, the honest truth here is that uh, it's a difficult one. Um, the Vavilov Institute itself is perpetually underfunded. Uh, the conditions there are not up to um, the international standards that are hoped for eventually. Uh, just had a nice conversation this morning uh, with our cotton curator that um, that there luckily is still interactions uh, with our countries back and forth to back up some, including backing up part of the Vavilov collection here. Um, so we are still very much connected to that institution. The Pavlov station you may have seen in the news, this is a, a field station of uh, particularly a berries that's just outside of Leningrad was in the news a couple of years ago because it was almost developed over for, for uh, houses. You might have seen that. Um, so far, that has been stayed, interestingly, through social media largely, through petitions and letters, through Twitter. Um, interesting new tools for, for petitioning for cons conservation. Um, the young folks in this room are, are probably more adept than the older folks, besides from Dr. Goetz, who seems to be an incredible Twitterer. Um, and, and, and that seems like a powerful tool. <clears throat> So I will end uh, with a few thoughts now on, on, on what Vavilov's method is or what it was. Um, I think that Vavilov's method really is actually the totality of his life. It's, 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 it's not so much something that he um, wrote down and said that people should do or other people should do, but how he lived it um, and, and how it played out, unfortunately cut short again. Um, I think his legacy is about the importance of collection, conservation, exploration of crop diversity. Still, utterly important to us for ending hunger, what we now call food security. If that, that terminology, uh, the Dobzhansky terminology of nothing in biology makes sense except in light of evolution, um, if that was applied to Vavilov, I think it might be nothing in food security, nothing in ending hunger makes sense except in light of the wise use or intelligent use of diversity. Uh, I wanted to mention, too, that Vavilov always emphasized that a great momentum, a great task of, of exploring on such a wide level necessitated publicly funded programs. 
something to think about. His legacy, of course, is these gene banks, which I mentioned, uh, which, which hold as arcs, but as living arcs that, that distribute this material for plant breeders around the world, this material. Um, his legacy is also the geography or the science of geography of understanding this material. And that's where uh, my work comes in, being fundamentally a crop diversity geographer, trying to understand where it comes from, what its uses might be because of, that, uh, because of those origins, its climates, its soils, et cetera. I think his legacy is a reminder of our global interdependence in terms of these genetic resources and the absolute necessity to collaborate internationally um, to obtain, to work on, to con conserve, and to share ultimately back out those genetic resources as a global public good. I think Vavilov really understood that. Um, and finally, uh, more back to the political side, I think that his story and, of course, the untimely death has a lot to speak about the importance of apolitical objective science. Whether he could have effectively mobilized an effort um, that would have been successful enough in his own nation at that time to have um, superseded how the politics went, nobody knows. He, of course, didn't have the tools we have to get together um, as a group and, and put out a, a, a consensus as, as a group of scientists, as, as a larger group of human beings. Um, but we have that now. And uh, um, to the extent or the fears that, that we may be heading into a time that's, um, that, that, that is going to challenge our ability to do objective science, I think we might remember this story and the importance of being promoters, as was mentioned um, by the first speakers, of the, the utter importance of science that's able to progress for humanity itself. So Vavilov's most important, most famous saying, I think, still remains pertinent. Time is short. Time is short. There is so much to do. Thanks very much. <clears throat> Hello. Uh, thank you, Dr. Colin Curie, for your wonderful presentation. Uh, we have several minutes for questions uh, from the audience. If you have a question, please raise your hand. We'll take a microphone over to you. <laughs> Any questions? So I have a question. Uh, the recent uh, trouble in the Syrian gene banks, right? Uh, how does how do uh, the global community? outreach these gene banks that are on perilous countries under war and under siege? How did, does their international community outreach these programs to do move out germplasm, to move to the uh, a bigger uh, germplasm collection? Are there, are there help for these gene banks that are under perilous, yeah, under this type of situation under war? Uh, yeah, great question. Um, and, and I think that's a question that could be answered a lot of different ways. Mm -hmm. I, maybe the question is, um, how does this network of, of seed banks work and, and what are the structures to, to, to help them in times of difficulty? Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, so the international centers, I'll, I'll just mention them a little bit if you don't mind. The international centers are quite important around the world, particularly for the developing world in terms of the seeds that they hold. They tend to hold crops like cassava uh, and, and, and beans that are very, very important for food security in developing regions. And they have persisted um, largely on three to five year funding cycles that aren't sustainable. One of the reasons for the Global Crop Diversity Trust was very much to try to resolve that issue financially, to have an independent foundation that would have an endowment, a fund, um, that would have enough money to make sure that those, those institutions have money. Uh, that is going okay, but definitely still needs more con contributions. And contributions are by governments largely. Um, and so what can be done by us is continuing to advocate, I think, in the United States for, um, for, for playing our part in the whole global role of funding, as we have one of the largest funders of the Global Crop Diversity Trust so far. Um, that system, I think, of creating Svalbard helped a lot with, 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 with uh, ICARDA in the sense of having a repository when a war happened. Because I'm not sure that we can predict 
um, in the next five or ten years exactly where some of these major strifer issues are going to happen. Um, but I will say that uh, the other side of it, the, politi the political issues, which were touched on a little bit yesterday, are very complicated, but I will emphasize are really, really important. Um, in the U.S. playing a role in those politics to, to ensure that there are systems out there that are trying to conserve diversity wherever they are and, and making sure that they're open, openly accessible are, are, are incredibly important to us. So I, I see those are the two ways that uh, people from the United States can, can, can advocate for a system that will work not only for us but for the rest of the world. I hope that helped answer part of your question. Any other questions from the audience? Do we have a mic here? Fascinating talk, uh, but you, all, all your emphasis, as I heard it, was seed banks, seed banks, seed banks. I work with clonally propagated crops. Where are we on, in that aspect of preserving these clonally propagated crops from an international point of view? Great. I, I feel like I should turn that question back around to you because you may know more than I do. I, I, I mean, I know in general that um, that it only sort of gets worse from seeds down or up or where, however you want to go. And so uh, a lot of collections around the world that are of, of clonally propagated crops are not well conserved or a limited amount of genetic diversity is conserved to them. Certainly that's true of cassava. Uh, I can say that from the Seat side. The Pavlox station was an interesting one. Uh, I understood, by the way, I'll just I'll note on that, that station that I, that I noted back there, um, arguably one of the most diverse field sites in the world in terms of small fruits, uh, especially ribes and I think rubus and a few others, blueberries, these sort of things. Uh, a question I got when I gave a, a talk a little bit about this a while back was, well, after World War II happened, you said, you know, you said that these folks wanted to save these seeds and once the craziness ended, um, you know, they would go out. Well, what happened? Did they actually go out? Uh, unfortunately, the documentation on that isn't great in terms of the seeds, but in fact it is quite great in terms of the, the clonally propagated stuff. Um, the, the, the Russian Federation produces 90% or so of ribes in the world, and it really came out of this collection post-World War II. Um, so these collections that have survived I, I documented an important role, certainly in industry. So I, I certainly hope that there's, there's money that goes there, and thank you for the reminder that this isn't all about seeds, that there's a lot of other types of germplasm out there. Um, that need different forms of conservation and, and, and propagation. Uh, a follow-up question real quick. Uh, I also work with ornamentals. And that's another aspect that I don't see international movement on preserving ornamental germplasm, even though if you look from an economic point of view, it's extremely important with respect to the economic well-being of, of quite a few people throughout the world. Thank you. Any other questions from the audience? We have one more. Damon, do you have one more question? Oh, okay. Oh, one more question. Mitchell? I was just curious, what international laws are used to protect uh, these, these seed collaborations internationally? Yeah, and again, we, we had a workshop yesterday um, and I, one of the results that came out of it for me was that, uh, I, if you don't mind me saying, that it might be worth in another year or another time having a full day even or half a day just on the politics of understanding them because they are um, extensive and complicated. If you don't mind, I will just list out a few that maybe some research um, can be done to understand. The, the first one that's absolutely necessary to understand is the Convention on Biological Diversity that started in 1992. Um, the essential transition there was from a system before that goods were essentially considered kind of just public or global or, or nobodies to becoming national sovereignty. And that was seen as important in terms of um, doing a better job of conserving diversity of people saying, well, this is ours, we're going to take care of it. But it also created more of a closed border system. Um, a response to that system for agricultural seeds because the borders were, were so closed off and that was difficult, is the International Treaty on Plant Genetic Resources for Food and Agriculture, 2002 to 2004. Um, worth reading up on that one to try to understand that. Um, 
and that that is that is basically it fits within the convention but says well countries really need each other to share these seeds so we're going to create a system that's kind of prearranged where we can more easily um, obtain germplasm and also help each other out with conserving it better um, monetarily and etc uh, and the third one to mention which is much more recent is called the Nagoya protocol which is uh, which is really also still the Convention on Biological Diversity dealing with material that's not in the international treaty because it's not all agricultural species that are so far in the international treaty. Um, so in fact, if you want to work on peanuts, uh, you, you can't deal with the treaty at this point. You do need to deal with the Nagoya Protocol. So those are the three. Um, Convention on Biological Diversity, International Treaty on Plant Genetic Resources, Nagoya Protocol. Any further questions for Dr. Curry? Well, with that, uh, please thank, uh, let's thank Dr. Curry for the second time for his wonderful presentation.